Hey, welcome to the SciShow Talk Show that day on SciShow, where we talk to interesting folks about interesting stuff. Today, we've got Professor of Wildlife Science John Marsloff from Wa the University of Washington. There's too many universities in your town, in your state, and yeah. I almost said the wrong one, but I said the right one. You did, thank so you. So that's what matters. How are you doing? Great. How are you? Good. Good. So you, uh, you study some kind of wildlife. I do. A variety. Okay. Um, I think you are best known for your work with corvids. What is a corvid? Uh, it's one of a type of bird that's in a, a particular family that includes the crows, ravens, magpies, jays, nutcrackers. Huh. Quite a diversity. Uh, and I feel, like, uh, I feel like we hear a lot about these kinds of birds in relationship to their smarts. So yeah. wh why, do, why, do we, uh, wh why do we particularly hear about corvids when we're talking about things being, you know, when we're, when we're sort of re doing research and being like, maybe humans aren't so unique in right. the way that we think. Well, they're clever, they're um, inventive, they use tools, uh, they manufacture tools, some species. They have big brains for their body size, and um, they're quick studies. They learn mm -hmm. new things, whether it's a vocalization or a behavior or a type of food to eat. They learn them really quickly. So, so is that most of the research that you do is uh, on the behavior and uh, learning styles of birds? Mine's been on a variety of things, really, with the corvids, everything from their social behavior to um, their role as a, as a threat to other species because they are also predators. Uh, mm -hmm. And so they have increased in response to human activity in mm -hmm. many places, some species, and that translates into a challenge for rare species that live there. So interesting. looked at a lot of things, but um, kind of focusing on brain activity and how the brain allows them to do some of these things now as well. It's always a little tricky <clears throat> when we're talking about the intelligence of another species because what do we really know about yeah. how even we think? Uh, but then moving from, you know, out of our species into other species, um, do you think we have a tendency to try and apply our sort of understanding of what thought is to other species too liberally? Well, I think it's kind of the only model we have, you know, yeah. you, you know how you think about things and visualize and plan and uh, arrange your um, actions and we assume other vertebrates do it that way. I think it's not too big of a leap, frankly, yeah. because we share a common ancestor. We have the same nervous system, basically, the same cells, the same chemicals that modulate their activity. Mm -hmm. Even though we're very different animals, um, there's still a lot of the same machinery there. So why wouldn't some of the experiences and, mm -hmm. and ways of doing things be similar? Mm -hmm. So how does your research function? Is it uh, mostly inside of a laboratory, or is there a lot of field work? Well, I, I really like the combination. Yeah. Um, I've always tried to do um, field observations and let those observations motivate what kind of things you then might do in the lab. Mm -hmm. And the lab for me might be uh, literally in the basement of the hospital doing um, you know brain imagery, or it might just be a big aviary where you try to keep things as natural as possible, but just vary one or two factors at a time to, to really understand things. So but it's all motivated by what you see animals do in nature. So you're actually taking a, a, a bird and putting it through some kind of imaging scan to, it, while it's conscious to see how, how that functions, or is it just? So it's an interesting, that would be one way to do it, but yeah. you'd have to have the animal stay perfectly still, yes. right? And just tell it. <coughs> you yes. said they're smart. <laughs> Sit, <laughs> lay down and relax, yeah. yeah. Uh, no, uh, they've done that with some dogs now. Yeah. They've okay. trained some dogs, but it's got to, it's got to fail more times than it works. You mm -hmm, know, I mean, mm -hmm. the, the, the really key uh, is that the animal's got to be perfectly still or you do not get a quality image. So, so the, the way to get a perfectly still animal is to have a dead one, usually. Or anesthetize it. Okay, and so that's you're actually living, okay. We anesthetize the birds, but the cool thing is the technique we use, which is called pet imagery, mm -hmm. it's not the MRI that you might mm -hmm. think of when you, when you think of brain scans. Mm -hmm. It's like that, but it, tracks kind of where there's a lot of um, energy demands being brought to the cells as opposed to blood flow. Oh, okay. And the nice thing is you can give the birds a tracer uh, that simulates um, glucose that's you know okay. supplying the energy, mm -hmm. but it's got a radioactive label, and you let the bird do its behavior while it's assimilating that glucose mimic, and the label, the radioactive label, stays in the parts of the brain that were active at that time. Right, right. 
Then you anesthetize the bird, mm -hmm. scan it, and basically look back in time at what's going on in its brain. And so you can see that there are sort of analogous structures to what we might have doing an activity as a human. Yes. I, I imagine a bird brain and a human brain are, have similar parts, but have a lot of functional differences. There's some similar parts and there's some very different yeah. parts. Uh, one that is uh, homologous between humans and, um, and birds is the hippocampus. Okay. The center of uh, memories, especially spatial or social memories. And that's an older part of the brain, right? It's an older part of the brain. Uh, it's a part of the limbic system that you hear about. And it's very important for us navigating and, and remembering and doing mm -hmm. a lot of the pretty sophisticated sorts of behaviors we do. Well, birds have those as well. And we've shown that that part of the crow's brain, for example, is used to learn about dangerous situations. So mm -hmm. things that are associated with the the sight of a dead crow, uh, when, a, when a crow sees another dead crow, the hippocampus is activated. Mm. So they're presumably learning the, the set or the, the people and other things that are around it at that time. It's interesting research. You're just like showing crows, dead crows. We, yeah, it, it is kind of, <laughs> kind of weird, but yeah. what, what else Definitely. do you do? I you mean, it is, it's interesting that that's a significant psychological event for a crow yeah. to see another dead crow. It is, and it's, um, and it's, and it's not black and white. Um, like it isn't for us. If we see a, a dead person that we don't know, mm. or in a different situation, a young or an old person, you might react differently. You know, an old person, okay, well, it's their, their time. Mm -hmm. uh, a young person, what a shame. You might have a very yeah. different emotional and uh, brain reaction to that. So we're finding uh, with some ongoing experiments now that birds do react differently. Mm. Crows react differently to the sight of a young or an old dead crow. Uh, they react differently probably to one they know versus don't know. We haven't wow been able to do that experiment yet. Uh, you can imagine the, yeah. uh, the ethics of it are, <laughs> are beyond what, what yeah. I would be willing to do. Right. So, but um, they probably respond in a very nuanced way to a dead crow as well. Yeah, fascinating. So um, I, I've heard also that crows are able to very easily recognize human faces. Yes. Uh, how do you know that? We, um, we always suspected it when we would go out and study mm -hmm. crows. One thing you have to do is catch them or climb to their nest and, and look at their young or their eggs, you know, mm -hmm. and so you're threatening to them when you do that. And we always suspected they were very responsive to us uh, after an event like that. They either hid from us or they scolded us or they um, tried to sneak around in ways that mm -hmm. we couldn't follow them as easily. And so we decided to do an experiment uh, where we wore a mask to change our identity. And, and that, wasn't, that wasn't more scary? Because <laughs> yeah. it's like, somebody's climbing up into my house wearing a mask. I was <laughs> like, that's definitely two steps more than just the drunk guy who doesn't know which house he's at. Well, it was more scary to the owners of the homes <laughs> when we did this, absolutely. <laughs> to the birds, I don't think it mattered. It was yeah. still a, you know, a predator climbing up to right. their nest. Mm -hmm. But it allowed us to hand off that identity to different people and have them encounter the birds and see the response after we did something. Right. In our case, we captured them for this instead mm -hmm. of walking to their, climbing to their nest. And uh, they responded dramatically after uh, a person had captured them when they saw that person again. And it didn't mm -hmm. matter if it was you wearing it or any of us wearing it, um, that face. That's what they responded to. Uh, what do you think uh, over those last, oh, 35 years have been sort of the most fascinating moments for you as a scientist? Well, that, you know, those, those rare moments of discovery, um, they're, they're hard to imagine what they're going to be. Mm -hmm. uh, when you look back on them, they're, um, you know, they're very important to us, but at the time, you, you really don't know. So I, I would go back to the first time when we did this uh, facial recognition test. And to, to be honest with you, we kind of started it as a joke. Mm -hmm. And that um, we, we thought this happened. Nobody had actually directly tested. We thought, this is a simple experiment. We'll just do this. And we compared the response of a crows to a caveman mask versus Dick Cheney as the other mask. And, um, you know, I thought this is going to be an experiment that we do in a few weeks' time, and we're yeah. done. And we yeah. can just have a neat slide to, uh -huh. to make people laugh about it. Well, you know, now 10 years later, the birds are still recognizing that dangerous face. And amazing me, frankly, every time I go out and they respond to, to that caveman that we used to capture them. Mm -hmm. Because I thought, um, I wasn't even sure if they would initially at all, and they did very strongly. And then to have continued and to pass it on to others that didn't experience it has oh, been wow. really um, So they, they pass, they, they are able to have that information passed 
they're able to socially learn information, mm -hmm. and in this case, we know that the great majority of birds that attack us now when we wear that mask weren't even born when, when we actually captured the birds. Um, so you've no, you have not captured the birds with that mask since? 10 years. Wow. Yeah. And, they, and they're big fans of Dick Cheney? Um, they're starting Dick to... Dick Cheney the control? Dick, Dick was the control, and they were big fans of his to begin with. They didn't care at all. But now they're starting to um, think he might have had something to do with it as well. <laughs> and they're definitely <laughs> scolding him more. I think they're starting to generalize, you know, right. it's a mask now as opposed right. to um, something which else. Which mask it is. Yeah, yeah. which mask. We showed <laughs> initially they could distinguish very fine differences in masks. But yeah. um, now I think it's kind of like, uh, that could be another bad guy. So. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, we have a Corvid to, to interact with. Uh, it's a, a somewhat, uh, was it named Rook? Rook is a little bit uh, shy, as you might expect. Yep. But ama like, always amazing to be up, 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 up close to a raven, which are just fascinating and surprisingly gigantic birds. Yes. <laughs> yes. So let's, uh, let's have Rook show up. Sounds great. Good so job, it's, buddy. it's nice to have a guest who's uh, experienced at this, of being nearby the animal. Um, how how close? How much time have you spent close to ravens? Quite a lot. I did um, three years of work in the woods of Maine uh, with ravens, and we were catching ravens and um, monitoring them in the wild as well as in big cages. We had a pair that bred and raised young. This we had them living alongside our house, and mm -hmm. it was we were we were living like ravens. My wife and I for for three years up there it was awesome. Awesome. Oh wow. Yeah. So what what do you think of his behavior right now? He's very curious. You know, he's looking. A lot of birds would yeah they would just be there he goes. freaked out. I betcha. Or they would be um, very unobservant. You know, a, a raptor closed down. Would, would kind of be closed down. They yeah. might be looking at a few places, looking for a place to get out. He's probably, he's checking us all out, but he's also just looking like, how do I get out of here? He <laughs> is. He's like, wait a second. Yeah. <laughs> well, we have, to, we have to work really hard to, to keep him from getting bored and, and depressed and, and uh, you know, hurting himself or, or yeah. any of those things. Do you have toys? So with. many toys. So mm -hmm. he's like, he gets like um, children's toys, like one to five year old toys, puzzles and, and other things. He loves those. Now the, the rope pulling up things, we hang things from ropes. He does that? Purchase. He does it. Yeah. He does it. Yeah. Um, I don't know where he learned it, but we did it and he didn't touch it um, when we were watching. And mm -hmm. then I went back and it was gone. Yep. The food was massacred. Yep. <laughs> um, so the, the interesting that, that thing that just recently happened, so we've had him for almost two years now, mm. and uh, uh, we clean him regularly, but um, we found one of his stash one of his stashes. Oh. So we thought he was eating all of his food, and he was. Um, he gets a mixture of a whole bunch of different stuff. And one of the things is dog food, uh -huh. and because they love dog food, and um, it's good for him too. Yep. Um, so we found this stash, and it was under his water dish, so far under that we couldn't see it. And the only way he could have gotten it under there is if he would have pushed it with a, a tool, a stick. Mm. So he oh. is. He's hiding his food with tools. Nice. And he was doing it on the covert. Like, we had no idea it was Have going on. Have you seen him now do that? No. No. So he's he doesn't sneaky. let anybody see it. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Where are you Very going? Cool. I think we should go back now. Yeah. We I'm... can call that a day. You did amazing, Rook. You did so good. And, yep, we're going to go again. All right, come on, buddy. Just let us know if you need a Band-Aid. <laughs> <laughs> we're good. Good job, okay. buddy. And wanna, I want to know more about, uh, I want to just see what, Rook does in his spare time. I know. I want to put like one of those those like twenty four cam. hour cams yeah. up and see what is he doing. We just got uh, one of those for our aviary, so we're going to have uh, four cameras in there now all the time. Nice. And so, because this is the kind of thing, yeah. You you come into the cage for the next day, and it's like, hmm, <laughs> something's gone on here, and I have no <laughs> idea what. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yep. We've uh, we've experienced. So we started all these different toys. So, so kids, ch children's toys, they're, he's really into. But he also likes just destroying things. And so the, the easiest and cheapest way to let him destroy things is cardboard boxes and paper balls of, uh, and blankets and stuff. And so we hide his food inside those and mm -hmm. we'll come back the next day. And it's, the cardboard box is not just gotten into, it is ripped into hundred little tiny pieces and scattered everywhere. Mm -hmm. So he, he 
had fun. He likes mm -hmm. that. <laughs> he likes doing that. <laughs> so that'd be fun to see, yeah. you know. Why is he doing it? How is he doing it? How fast? Yeah, what's going yeah. on there? Yeah. Be fun. But as soon as we come over, he's like, not doing anything. Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> not going to give his secrets up quickly. Yeah. Um, well, Jesse, thanks for showing Rook off for us. Rook, yeah. thanks for coming by. Goodbye. Yeah. I'm so, he did so good today. He did really, really good. Proud of him. Yeah. And John, thank you for sharing uh, so much. My pleasure. Uh, and if people want to know more about your work and what you do, uh, what should we read? What, what should we look at? Um, you, can, you can go to the, to the website, the University of Washington um, Avian Conservation Lab is my lab, and there's lots of uh, articles there you can get or videos and things you can see. Um, some books. Um, if you're really interested in ravens, my wife and I wrote about the ravens we studied in a book called Dog Days, Raven Nights. And that's kind of fun, how you do science and, um, and some of the things we learned about their behavior. And more recently, I've been working on urban, urban birds. So a book called Welcome to Suburbia mm -hmm. is about our urban research. So you could check those out and, and all, all sorts of neat things on the web about crows and ravens. It's great. A lot of neat things out there. Well, thank you very much My for, pleasure. for joining you. us. If you want to see more of what Jessie does, you can go to youtube.com slash Animal Wonders Montana. We do a show with her where we, sh uh, you know, it's just sort of the daily life of this person who does this crazy, amazing <laughs> thing in my small town. Um, and if you want more of this, we are SciShow, and you can go to youtube.com slash SciShow and subscribe. Mm -hmm.